Good morning and welcome back to Dr. Logic Awkwardly Does Logic in Her Office. I hope you're ready to do some propositional proofs today because I've got a couple of examples for you. And then at the end, I'm going to leave you with a whole bunch of exercises for you to try at home. So this will be your chance to kind of get stuck in and see, can you put the rules together? Do you understand the sorts of things that I've been doing? Try it out yourself because really the way to learn how to do these proofs is by trying to do them. So examples and some things for you to try yourself in this video. Next video, after you've seen a bunch of these examples and you've tried it some yourself, I'll start talking to you about strategy because there is actually strategy that you can use for proving all of these, these things. Not quite in the way with the syllogisms where it basically tells you every single step you need to do, but I can give you kind of pointers and guides and it's like if you're ever doing a proof and you're stuck, these are the things to look for, these are the things to ask yourself, and hopefully with a little bit of, uh, of, kind of pointers and advice, you can get yourself out of any, you can get yourself unstuck from any place that you're stuck. Let's put it that way. So example first, let me get up my whiteboard. There we are. This one is going to be a little bit more complicated than some of the ones that we saw in the previous example videos. So here we have the first premise is that if G or H implies both S and T and either T or U implies C and D, then from this, we can prove that G implies C. So left-hand side of our turnstile are the premises, right-hand side is the conclusion. How does every single proof start? Every single proof starts by writing down your premises as assumptions. So we have if G or H, then S and T, and T or U, if that, then C and D. So these are our, sorry, they are our premises, but what allows us to write them down in our proof is the assumption rule. So we put a little line under there just to indicate these are our assumptions. Now, where do we go? Always look at your conclusion first. Our conclusion is if G then C, what is the main connective? The main connective is an implication. So in order to get this conclusion, we will at some point need to introduce an implication. What's the implication introduction rule? This is the one that says, start off by assuming the antecedent of the conditional that you want to introduce. So here's our assumption. And then as I said, it's often useful to make notes to yourself as to why you're making these assumptions and how you're gonna get rid of them at the end of the proof. So this isn't part of the formal annotations. This is just, you know, for my sake and for yours. This is an assumption and it's for conditional introduction and our goal is to attain, is to obtain the propositional atom C. So look at your premises. Where does C occur? Well, we have it in the consequence of the second conditional. Can't really do anything to get there yet because the only rule that would allow us to apply here is the conditional elimination rule, but we would need to have that antecedent and we don't. So take a look at where we have our assumption. Where else does G occur? Well, G occurs in the first premise, G or H implies S and T. So we would be able to use conditional elimination on this connective if we have the antecedent, the antecedent here is G or H. And you know what? Since we already have G, conditional, sorry, disjunction introduction says that we can write down G or H. So that's just disjunctive introduction on line three. And now between line one where we have a conditional, line four where we have the antecedent of that conditional, through conditional elimination, we can write down the consequence. So that's conditional elimination, lines one and four. Now, this is useful because we needed to have something involving T to get the antecedent of line two. Here we have T. We need to separate it from the rest of the formula, but conjunction elimination tells us that if you have a conjunction, you can write down one of the conjuncts. So there we have it. And then we can 
build this back up by adding u via disjunction introduction on line six. T or u is the antecedent of the conditional in line two. So at line eight, we can write down the consequence C and D. So that's conditional elimination lines two and seven. And now again, just as we had at line five, we had a conjunction and we took one of the conjuncts out. Here we have a conjunction and we'll take one of the conjuncts out. So uh, conjunction elimination on line eight. And would you look at that? Our goal when we made this assumption of G was to get C. We have gotten C. So we can end this little subproof that we have and terminate that scope line, move outside so that what we are concluding here depends only on our initial assumptions, our initial two premises. And we can say, well, if you give me G, then I can prove C. And that's what we need for conditional introduction. And this is one of the rules that cites not two lines or one line, but an entire range of lines. So everything from lines three to nine is our justification for introducing this conditional. There you have it. Isn't that satisfying? Let me give you one more example. So let's clear this. This one is also involving a whole bunch of disjunctions in the premises. So we have either F or, sorry, D implies T. We have not F, we have D, and from this, we want to show that T is the case. So premises on the left of the turnstile, conclusion on the right. Let's write our premises down. We've got F or D implies T. We have not F and we have D. So all of these are our initial assumptions and we want to prove T. Now, T is a somewhat tricky little conclusion because it doesn't have any connectives in it. So we can't just look at it and say, oh, it's a conditional. I need to use conditional introduction. It's just an atom. So there are a couple of different ways that you can think about how to prove something like this. But if you are ever in doubt, if you ever don't know how to get started with a proof, you can always use negation elimination or negation and introduction. So in this case, we want something that doesn't have a negation. So what happens if we assume not T? So this is our assumption. Then why are we doing this? We are doing this for negation elimination and our goal is to get a contradiction. Now, this is not always the most helpful of goals because we don't know what contradiction it's going to be, but we can give it a try. Now, if you look at our premises, D is just a plain atom, F is a, uh, is a negation. None of the rules that we have allow us to do something with either of these. We don't have a rule that tells you what to do something with atoms unless you are combining them into something more complex like disjunction introduction or con conjunction introduction. We don't have something for getting rid of a negation unless it is a part of a subproof like this. So the only thing that we have is this disjunction. So here's a chance to see the disjunction elimination rule in, the, in process, in action. What I'm gonna do is I'm first going to reiterate the disjunction down here, just so that we kind of have everything that we need in this little subproof and you're not looking back up to your premises and things. Now, what we want to show is that from either of these, we can get, we can get something. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell you that what we want to try to get is one of the disjuncts itself, D implies T. How do I know that that's what I'm going for? Well, take a look at the first two premises. The first one says either F or D implies T. The second one says it's not F. And so if you think about the truth of things, then you know, well, then we should be able to get D implies T. What would this look like? Well, first, 
you need two subproofs, one for each of the disjunctions. So this is our first one. Our goal is to get D implies T. And so you might think, oh, I should, it's a conditional, I should introduce a conditional. But you already know that you can do things with contradictions because here you have an F and here you have a not F. So I'm gonna show you a very slick little trick. I want to prove D implies T. So I'm going to assume, so now you can see we've got all sorts of nested assumptions in here. I'm gonna to have to get rid of them eventually. But I'm going to assume not D implies T. And then I can reiterate line six, reiterate line two, which says not F, and look at that. Here we have a contradiction. So we assumed not D implies T. From this, we could derive both F and not F. So by conditional, uh, sorry, negation elimination, I can get rid of that negation and just write down D implies T. So that is negation elimination, seven through nine. So now I've shown that from F, I can, I can prove that D implies T. Now I just need to show that the same thing holds with the other disjuncts. So here I have another assumption. Well, this is easy. If I assume that D implies T is true, then I can just reiterate it. Bam. And now we are in a position to be able to do something with disjunction elimination. We have a disjunction on line five. We have one subproof that starts with one of the disjuncts and ends up with some formula. We have another subproof that starts with the other disjunct and ends with the same formula. So whichever one is the case, we know that we can get D implies e T. So this is disjunction elimination, and we cite line five, line, or sorry, lines, because it's a subproof, six to 10, and 11 to 12. So disjunction elimination always needs to cite one formula and two subproofs. Now, we are beginning to run out of space. This whiteboard is never tall enough. But I, then again, if I was in a lecture hall, that whiteboard would never be tall enough either. Let us go up here. We have this assumption of D as one of our premises. This is the antecedent of the conditional that D implies T. So conditional elimination applied to lines 3 and 13 allows us to get T. But T itself contradicts our assumption of not T up here at line 4. So our goal was to get a contradiction. Now, it could be with any arbitrary formula, but it's also perfectly all right to contradict the own assumption that you started with. So squeeze this in here, line 15. We are allowed to prove T through negation elimination, because we started off with a negation here and we ended up taking it away. And this is the entire subproof from four to 14. Hopefully you can still see that. There you have it. Another proof that shows you how the disjunction elimination rule works. Now, I promised you some examples that you could work on on your own. So I'm going to stop sharing the whiteboard and let me just get the file up. Here we go. I think this is the one. So hopefully right now you see a list that says some things to prove. And I'm sorry that the letters are so small, but this is 23 different possibilities for you to prove. So I don't know, pause your screen, zoom in, if you're really having trouble reading it, drop me a comment in the comments and I'll find some other way to give you this, you know, I could split it up into a couple of slides and show them in larger print. But everything that's on the left-hand side of the turnstile are your premises. Your goal conclusion is on the right-hand side. Give it a go. See what you do. I hope you have fun. And if you have any questions, let me know in the comments because I'm happy to talk through these in any particular issues or ways or anything that you have. Anyway, that was a rather long video, but I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you had fun. Join me next time for proof strategies. Until then, take care. Cheers.